Hey everybody, hope you're doing well. Happy Sunday. I know things are odd and uh, different. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying safe and, uh, and healthy and uh, adjusting to these uh, just unprecedented times. It uh, just seems to be getting stranger and stranger. Anyway, um, I just wanted to try to update you on some stuff that's going on and uh, give you a short message to encourage you, hopefully. And um, I want to share a few prayer requests with you. Brandy Stanley contacted us and uh, told us that her son Andrew was laid off and uh, that his wife is pregnant. So uh, he needs a job and just pray for the pray for a safe and healthy pregnancy. And ask the Lord to bless and help them. Uh, Brittany, Mitchell's wife, was laid off. Kennedy was laid off. Elizabeth said Forest Company, Forest's company was going to lay some people off. So she asked we pray that, that uh, for them, hopefully he won't be one of them. And uh, I mentioned uh, in one of the emails, Merle Moore had some tests done. They think, I believe he has, has been diagnosed with lymphoma. And they're trying to uh, decide what kind of steps to take. So pray for Merle, if you would. Also, Zach Cootie, that's um, Nadine's grandson, if you would pray for him. My Uncle Wayne Brewer, um, he's recovering in the hospital. Just pray that, uh, pray the Lord to help him uh, to get better. And then also, just all the folks in the, on the prayer list, uh, all the families of the church and their extended family members. It's just a difficult, difficult time. Um, anyway, so just pray for all these folks. Pray for one another. And um, ask the Lord just to uh, be near and, uh, and to help all the folks uh, through this. I, uh, I'm feeling better. I feel like I've been kind of out of pocket for almost three weeks, but I'm not, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's medicine related or what, but I am better. I appreciate you praying. If you would just continue to pray that I completely get over whatever this is. Uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, the church were remodeling the, um, kitchen and fellowship room. It looks awesome. But we have a long ways to go, and with this stay in place thing, it's kind of difficult to uh, to get up there and work on it. But uh, anyway, think about it, pray about that. Uh, I'm excited about that. It's going to turn out really well. So uh, praise the Lord for that. Um, before we get into the message, why don't we bow our heads? We'll pray together, and then we'll uh, then I'll give you a couple thoughts. Father, we do thank you for another day. And Lord, thank you for all your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your kindness to us. Uh, we don't deserve any of your blessings. Lord, I do pray for all these folks. I think about Merle, that you'd help uh, him and Doris through this time. All these folks that have lost their jobs, we pray, Father, you'd help them. I pray you'd help our country, our leaders, Lord, to make wise decisions. And bless all these people, Lord, that, that need work and um, that are impacted financially, economically. Lord, I pray that you'd be with uh, Brandy's son, Andrew, that you'd help him and his wife, just help him to find work and uh, bless the pregnancy. And Lord, I pray uh, for all the other needs, uh, this Zach that was mentioned and my Uncle Wayne and others, Lord, that just need help. We pray you bless and help them. Lord, help us to, to be strong and to rest in you uh, during these days. And we thank you, Lord, for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, I feel a little odd sitting at the, the breakfast table. Welcome to my kitchen. And um, I may, from this, from... I may do the next one at the church just behind the pulpit, uh, but I just wanted to share a couple things with you. <clears throat> I, I've got several messages, 
And um, um, anyway, I just I'm going to share something with you this morning. I hope it'll be blessed to you. And basically, uh, several people have asked, you know, do and not just you know in my little circle, but just around the world. The thought is, is this the end? Is the end coming? And uh, does this is does this virus is this signaling the end of the world? Basically, I read an article uh, last night that was just, it's just a couple of weeks old. It said it begins. Chuck Pierce's son was concerned, like a lot of other people, looking out on a world of ransacked grocery stores, canceled sports seasons, eerie lines of people standing six feet apart from one another, and he asked his dad, is this the end of the world? The worldwide upheaval caused by the fast-spreading virus has many people reaching for their Bibles and wondering, could this be a sign of the apocalypse? Some have said it sure feels apocalyptic. And uh, one of them uh, ends up, the article ends up by saying, these signs should send non-Christians rushing toward the Bible so they can convert while there's still time. And so anyway, it's on a lot of people's minds. I've had a couple of people ask me, what are my thoughts on it? I, uh, I wanted to share a few things with you. I think, I hope it'll be an encouragement to you. Um, but when it comes to the end of the world, you know, if you ask, is this the beginning of the end? My answer would be not that I know of and not, Certainly not what the Bible, I don't think the Bible speaks of. And the reason people, I think, sometimes kind to kind of relate uh, tragedies or, or these uh, difficult times to the end times is because they, they don't have a clear understanding of the Bible. And so I've just got three points I want to mention. Number one, you know, People, when, they, when they're going through these difficult times, there's confusion about the scriptures. And some of that confusion comes from when they read their Bible, they see things and they say, boy, you know, these things must happen before the end of the world. And some of that comes from Matthew 24 and 25, which is called the Olivet Discourse. And let me just read you a couple of verses or a few verses from that. Verse 1 of Matthew 24 says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I send you, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, his disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of, the, of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they wanted to know, uh, when the end of the world would be, and I think it's literally end of the age there, but in verse 4, Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and he shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So when people read those verses, they tend to create a list in their mind and think, boy, these things have to happen before the end of the world comes. Well, the end for the believer is different than the end of the world, if, if I can say it that way. The end for the believer is, is either, it happens in two ways. Either he dies or he's raptured. That, that's the end for the believer. And so the question would be, is Matthew 24 and 25 talking about the rapture? And the answer is no, it is not. Uh, Matthew 24 and 25 do describe the tribulation period and some judgments associated with the nation of Israel, but it's not speaking of the rapture. And if we confuse Matthew 24 and 25 into thinking that these are the things that have to happen before the rapture, then that's why we're going to confuse when things like this pandemic happen and say, you know, this could be the end of the world. Now, could, th could this be a sign of the Lord coming? I suppose you could say anything like this could be a sign, but I just want you to stay with me. These 
verses in these chapters are not speaking of the rapture. Now, I want to read you a couple more. Uh, verses 40 and 41 say, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the meal, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And so, obviously, people are going to say, well, that sounds like the rapture. One person's taken out and one person's left. And it does appear to uh, present itself that way, but it's not speaking of that. The context is, is from verse 37 and th through 39. 37 says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And he knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In the days of Noah, Noah was preserved in the ark, and the people that were left were taken away in judgment, or they died. So it's the exact opposite. The picture in Matthew 24 is the exact opposite of the rapture. In the rapture, the Lord comes and raptures his saints out, okay, and he leaves the other people in, in the world. In Matthew 24, the Lord comes and the people that he takes are the people are he taking in judgment. And the people that are he is leaving are the people that will be left to uh, be in the millennial kingdom. So it's the exact opposite picture. Now, there's multitudes of books written about this. There's many great scholars who have commented on this. You can Google it and there's some great articles on it. I would encourage you to do it. But I would just say this, there's confusion when these things happen. People begin, they, they say this, well, you know, there must be time, some time left, so I've got time to get my life squared away. You know, there's time because all of these things have to happen. These earthquakes and floods, and you know, one thing I didn't read was this, uh, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. I remember hearing that as a kid, but, the Lord couldn't come back until the gospel was preached in all the world. That's not speaking of the rapture, okay? And part of the confusion there, again, is the rapture and the second coming are two different events. There's the first advent when Christ came as a baby, okay? He was born in Bethlehem. The second advent is when he comes to judge the nations. In between those two is the rapture of the church. Uh, so, so there's confusion, and, and in that confusion, that creates three things quickly. It creates time in people's minds. So here's what people say. Well, you know, I've got all these lists here, you know, these nations and pestilence and earthquakes and all, all these things have to happen. The gospel has to be preached. So in their mind, they're thinking this, I've got time. And in reality, okay, that confusion kind of leads to deception. Um, the time issue when it comes to the rapture, we don't have time. The rapture could happen today. And so people have in their mind, even believers create this thing, well, I still have the Lord's return at, at arm's length. I know there's some more things that have to happen. It, it, it's kind of like the old story of the three demons who were talking to the devil and, the, and, the, uh, and they were talking about how they would deceive the world. And the first demon tells the devil, well, if I was going to deceive the multitudes, I would tell them there's no heaven. And, um, and the devil said, well, yeah, that would deceive some, but you know, most people believe in heaven, so that, that's probably not the best way. The second little demon said, well, you know, I'll spread the message there's no hell. And the devil said, well, you know, that would deceive some as well. And, and he said, but most people believe there's a hell because of consequences of their life. He said... You know, so that, that probably wouldn't be the best way. Well, the third little demon, he said, I'll tell him there's no hurry. There's no hurry to get right. There's no hurry to be what God wants you to be. God's, you know, my list, he hadn't fulfilled all this stuff, so he's not coming. That's the confusion. Time. The second thing is test. There's all kinds of books out there that are testing all of it. Every day they read the newspapers. They read, their, they read the events of the world. 
And they say all of these things have to fit into place before the Lord returns. The third thing is their own theories. I've got my own theory about when the Lord will come back. You say, well, is it right? I doubt it, but I have my own theory. I don't think the Lord will come back till He's saved every soul that's willing to be saved. The Lord's not willing that any should perish. Does that mean that, that I have that the Lord may not come back for hundreds of years? No. That's just my theory. And I think all kinds of... Most people have theories. That's the confusion. This time, these tests, these theories. And uh, in that confusion, I think that's where people begin to get anxious because they think, oh, you know, these things are pointing to the end. The second thing is about the rapture. There's a confusion about the rapture. There's a description given in the Bible about the rapture. And that's in 1 Thessalonians 4. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, let me just read it to you quickly, and I'll try to go over this as quickly as I can. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul, as he was speaking to those believers in Thessalonica that were confused about those who had died and what would happen to them. And so he says in verse 13 of chapter 4, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep or have died, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus or have died in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but it comes from the phrase caught up, which means to be caught away or to be seized out of. Anyway, the rapture, the description of the rapture, just quickly is, the rapture is given with authority. He says in verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. So there's a certainty about the rapture. It's God's word saying it's going to happen. There's all kinds of theories out there about post-trib, pre-trib, um, mid-trib. You know, will we be raptured before the tribulation, whatever, all of that stuff, okay? In my opinion, we'll be raptured before uh, because of 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10. He says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Also in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to, to, sing, to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. But anyway, the, there is a certainty about the rapture because it's, it is based on God's Word. So it's going to happen. That's the authority. It's the, the Word of God. But there is the, uh, not only is there this certainty, there's this part that is going to happen unexpectedly. Paul writes here um, in verse 16, the Lord himself, no, verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Paul uses the pronoun we. He includes himself in the, into sharing that he believed the rapture could happen in his day. Okay? And there's a good um, section in this commentary about that. The rapture could happen any time. It's not, we can't gauge it by signs and wonders or special events. It's going to happen unexpectedly. And I'll read this in a second. Um, if you look down in chapter 5, in verse number 2, it says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So when you look at the rapture, Okay, the description of the rapture, it's built on the authority of God's Word. It, it's going to happen certainly, or with certainty, but it's going to happen unexpectedly. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen. 
It's going to, it can happen at any time. And that's the third part. The rapture is imminent, or it will be done imminently. You say, well, what does the word imminent mean? And that's what this commentary says. It says, the word imminent means ready to happen. Nothing has to occur for Christ to return except the calling out of the last person who will be saved and complete the body of Christ. That's it. So the rapture could happen immediately, imminently. Just like that old song says, I said it at church the other day, Jesus is coming soon, morning, night, or noon. We don't know. Many will meet their doom. But the Lord is coming back, and we don't know when he's coming. It's imminent. So the difference between the guy who's confused, he's like, all of these things have to happen, and then the Lord comes. The description the Bible gives of the rapture is that it could happen today. Now. So if you're waiting to get your life right until all these things line up, okay, that's, that's the confusion. Um, the rapture is something that, that makes us think, um, you know what? I could be in the presence of the Lord today, as in heaven. And I know I'm in the presence of the Lord now. So there's this confusion, there's a description, and the last thought is preparation. Okay, or, or motivation, I should say, motivation. So what should the response to this pandemic be? Well, it should, be motiv it should motivate us to realize, you know what, the Lord could come at any moment. We should prepare our lives to meet the Lord today. Um, we should be ready to meet the Lord today. Um, let, me, let me give you a couple of verses. So in first, uh, well, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared all unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The rapture, the... The truth of the rapture should motivate us to prepare our lives to be ready to meet God today. So those relationships horizontally, husband, wife, kids, co-workers, all of those things, we should, those things should be made right. Our relationship vertically with God should be right. The rapture should be something that should motivate us to preparation to meet the Lord. But it's not just preparation. I'll talk a little more about that. It is purification. In, in 1 John chapter number uh, 3, I'm almost through. Hang in there with me. In 1 John 3, listen to this. Says, well, this is 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Okay? We need to prepare for His coming. There's this preparation, but then in chapter 3 it says this, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew, knew not Him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that has this hope in Him purifies himself even as he is pure. The word pure there means to make clean. The rapture should motivate us to clean our life up because we want to be found, as it speaks of in a couple of other verses, without spot when, the, when, we, uh, when we meet the Lord. So it's not just preparation and meeting to be ready to meet the Lord, but it is purification of our life. And the last thought, it's participation in this life. And let me read sec, or Titus to you one more time. Listen to what he says. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The word present there means now. It means we should be living soberly, righteously, and godly today. We should be living in a way 
that is different from the world, righteously, godly, soberly. And then he says, not only living as a believer in a different way, looking for the Savior of us as believers. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. So the rapture should motivate us to prepare, to purify, but to participate in living like we should live, looking for His return, and loving our Savior. That's what it should do. So our response to this pandemic, in one sense, should be, you know what? It should, it should make me grow more serious about my commitment and consecration to live for God and to look for His coming. Because He could come today. There isn't any list that has to be accomplished. His return is imminent. It's the next thing on the prophetic list. I know there's all kinds of things written on the internet that this temple has to be built and all these animals have to be sacrificed. The rapture could happen today. And as believers, we should be ready for that. And uh, so, I had a little poem here I was going to read you. It says... Uh, Let's see what it says. It says, There's a man in yonder glory I have loved for many years. He's cleared my guilty conscience and banished all my fear. He's coming in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And no time will be allotted for you to utter one goodbye. No time to kiss the husband or embrace the loving wife if they are but united in the bonds of a holy life. Are you ready, Christian, ready for shout and trump and voice? Will his coming make you tremble or cause you to rejoice? He's coming. He can come today. So the response to this pandemic is I need to be ready to meet the Lord today. Um, and I want to encourage you. That should draw you closer to the Lord in your relationship. It should help you to refocus your life on what's really important. And what's really important is that the Lord can come today. And not to end on a negative note, but you know, you never know when you're going to die. We could die today. I hope I don't. You know, it's like the old fellow says, I'm ready to go to heaven. I just don't, I just don't want to go on the next bus load. I understand that. But you know what? None of us know when that time will be. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die. I was reading him through this last night. He said, it's not an accident. Your death's not an accident. Your death's an appointment. And you know, we just need to be ready to meet the Lord. So if you think about our responsibility in the world, we should be living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world today. I hope something says it's been an encouragement to you. I've got a couple other thoughts I'll uh, share through the week. Um, anyway, I, uh, again, I hope, uh, you're doing well, staying safe. I would encourage you to read your Bible every day, pray every day. And, um, uh, there's a lot of good uh, Bible studies through the internet, especially if you, uh, if you go to the Bible Broadcasting Network, there's some free online studies. And if you want some more information, let me know, or you can just Google that Bible Broadcasting Network. And uh, they have some free online Bible studies. But um, don't neglect your faith during this time. Draw closer to the Lord. Be ready. He may, he may come today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, bless our folks. I, uh, I pray to help each one. I know some are hurting. I know some are scared. And Lord, we just pray to help them. And Lord, help us to be ready to meet you. It could be today. We don't know. I pray that you'd help us to, to purify and to participate as a believer as we should and prepare our lives to meet you in Jesus' name. Amen.